welcome you all to the um, third and the last event in the fall 2019 series of the City Talks on the theme of politics and the city. My name is Denise Unsal and I'm a lecturer um, of anthropology at the University of Victoria and a member of the UV Committee of Urban Studies which runs the City Talks. I'd like to uh, begin by first acknowledging that this event is taking place on the traditional territories of the Lekwanga people <coughs> as well as acknowledge that the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the financial support of the Faculty of Social Sciences, as well as the Departments of Geography, History, Political Science, and Environmental Studies, and the Gustafsson School of Business, which have supported the City Talks this year. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the City Talks lecture series. And if you're interested in supporting us, the series, as a donor or a co-sponsor, we encourage you to visit our website at thecitytalks.ca for more information. Tonight's uh, City Talks event welcomes uh, Professor Jason Hackworth. He's a professor of geography and planning at the University of Toronto. His research focuses broadly on urban political economy within the North American context. Dr. Hackworth is the author of three books, The Neoliberal City, published by Cornell University Press in 2017, Faith Based, published in, by University of Georgia Press in 2012, and Manufacturing Decline, published in 2019 by Columbia University Press. So I'd like to invite Dr. Hackworth for his talk. Well, thank you very much for the generous introduction and to um, everyone who uh, is behind organizing the City Talks and inviting me to be here, Maggie and Ruben in particular, but whomever else that factors, whoever else is in, um, involved in organizing this event in this very beautiful space, it's a delight to be here. Um, you know, as was indicated before, the sort of proximate cause or the proximate reason I'm sort of traipsing around the uh, continent talking about this topic is that I have a book that just came out. And um, I want to talk a bit about that today um, in the sort of broader theme of this. And the, the book is uh, called Manufacturing Decline, Why, How Racism and the Conservative Movement Crushed the American Rust Belt. And I have a number of papers that um, are related to some of the themes that I'll go over in, in more kind of general terms today. So if anyone's sort of more interested in the detail that it might may have to sort of brush over, please feel free to email me and I'd be happy to do violence to the copyright laws by <coughs> sending you copies of those articles or whatever you're interested in or engaging. So please feel free uh, to reach out um, if I uh, skip past any detail that um, you'd like more uh, detail about. I guess I'd also like, as one other prefatory remark, uh, sort of note that, um, you know, this is a story, so my, a little bit about my own background, I sort of grew up in the States, I'm now a dual citizen, I've lived in Canada and taught in Toronto for uh, 17 years now. And uh, this sort of set of questions is really about kind of reflecting on the American Rust Belt, the kind of Great Lakes states, uh, the, the, the challenges of cities like Detroit and why they're so different in many ways than the cities like uh, Toronto on a variety of different levels. And so this story is really about uh, American cities, but I would sort of like to suggest, and perhaps if we have a Q&A session, I don't know if that's customary, at least um, we, perhaps we can draw that out, that this, this relationship that I'm about to talk about where uh, the relationship between social conflict or social hierarchy or racism of, of social um, uh, of hierarchy of one form or another and its impact on the shape of cities, the investment patterns in cities, the um, urbanization process in general, is not one that is unique to the United States. It is certainly takes a particular form in the United States, and I'm gonna talk about that, uh, but I do think that there is a, uh, a conversation to be had about how this sort of relationship plays itself out in other contexts. Uh, and so I'd be happy to talk more about that if you'd like uh, afterwards. Um, but again, yeah, the book is, is with Columbia University Press, people, Please uh, feel free to order uh, in these other articles if you're um, interested in more uh, details. Okay, so this this talk and um, this um, this issue, uh, this sort of underlying the book, really stems from two questions that I thought when I initially uh, posed them that were very very separate ones. The first of being 
what causes urban decline? Why does Detroit look the way it does? Why has it lost so much population versus other cities in the United States and versus other cities elsewhere in the world? What, what, what accounts for that kind of variation across space? And uh, the second is a question of um, sort of what causes or what, why is political conservatism in North America so dominant right now? And I thought of these things as incredibly separate, very um, uh, different questions. Uh, but the more I started researching both of them, they sort of started blending together in ways that I didn't expect and really kind of uh, came together in the book. So let's talk about the first one and the kind of prevailing kind of paradigms um, of um, what causes urban decline. If there's a general tendency within kind of urban decline, and by urban decline I mean the flight of people and or capital from urban space, and um, there's no sort of agreed upon threshold about sort of what level constitutes too much uh, flight of capital, too much flight of investment. But it is sufficient, you know, it is clear that places like Detroit have experienced so significant amounts of uh, population, have lost 60% of the population they once had uh, in the mid-20th in, in mid century. Cleveland is the same as St. Louis. There's a variety of large cities like this in the United States uh, that have lost catastrophic amounts of population investment in a variety of different forms. That have um, that, that that are you know in no one's book uh, doing um, uh, terrific uh, in, in the kind of economic terms. The way, at least in most literatures, that we understand this is almost exclusively through economic um, economic theory, sort of conventionally economic. That is to say, we're thinking about sort of jobs and housing prices. And so there's sort of uh, three schools of thought about urban decline in a sort of broader literature. The first, in particular, when it pertains to places like Detroit and Cleveland. Um, it is uh, deindustrialization is one, right? Like that is the, the idea here is that there is a, there is a, uh, you know, particularly a, you know, the job market collapses. One particular type of industry collapses. People, flip, you know, the reasons that they came to that place are suddenly evaporate. So they, so they, uh, they leave that place. And in very extreme cases, there's lots of land demand. I mean, people walk away from their houses. They decide that they just can't, they can't sell it to anyone, and so you get sort of large expanses of land. Um, uh, abandonment as well. And it's absolutely true that places like Detroit, places like Cleveland, places even like Toronto have lost uh, considerable numbers of uh, manufacturing employment, upwards of 90% of the manufacturing employment that they once had in the sort of mid 20th century. Manufacturing in the sort of eastern half of this continent used to be a much, much more important part of uh, urban economies. It is not as much anymore. It's true that if you focus on individual places, sure, Detroit has lost a lot. Uh, but it's, it's also true that lots of other places have and don't have the same kind of landscape that a place like Detroit does. The second kind of school of thought about sort of why there is kind of this level of kind of catastrophic land abandonment, and by that I mean sort of half or more of the houses in a particular neighborhood or city have been literally removed through demolition, um, is something called um, this sort of housing disassembly line. And it's basically the notion that, um, you know, just historically speaking, the oldest housing in a particular city um, um, is, is tends to be at the urban core, and, and then it sort of grows, you know, progressively outward in the suburbs. Um, when uh, that housing starts to age at the inner core, um, it becomes more difficult to sell, especially when you start building more and more housing on the fringe of the city. And the idea is that uh, once you make it so sufficiently difficult to sort of to uh, sell the housing in the inner core, then people start again abandoning the housing and you get sort of large scale abandonment. And that is again, if you look at individual regions, that is true. That is true that sort of in Detroit and Cleveland, the oldest housing is in the core. It's deteriorated, It's um, and there's lots and lots of new suburban housing that's built that's uh, less expensive to maintain, that's built on the fringe. People buy that, they abandon the inner core. Again, if you look at one place that works, it doesn't across the board, it doesn't sort of match that almost every city has that relationship and not every city looks like Detroit. The third issue is um, something called public choice theory, which is just sort of like a uh, kind of shorthand for conservative economics. And they sort of view government as a kind of business in a, in a sense. It's kind of a paradigm that views it that way. And they argue that the reason you see this sort of massive land abandonment in places like Detroit is that, that um, the taxes are just too high in the city, people flee, and the services are terrible, so schools, infrastructure, they flee and go to the suburbs, basically the same region. Again, that relationship holds that taxes tend to be higher per unit of property in Cleveland and Detroit and these, and these sort of uh, Rust Belt cities um, than their suburbs are, but that's the case across the region, so it doesn't help explain sort of why there's particular outcomes of 
uh, extreme abandonment in one case and, and, and not another. So the, the, these, these schools of thought, they're all very conventionally economic. They don't touch on, and, and that's sort of, um, and they don't sort of have great empirical power. That is to say, if you actually research these across and compare this kind of explanatory paradigm to a variety of different places, they're not all that powerful. So they don't help us understand what causes are going to decline all that well. And so I'm seeking to sort of like both offer a different in, in interpretation, but also to ex in, include something that I think has been very much overlooked and is often not discussed in this context. It's just discussed in other contexts, but it's not discussed in this context. And that is the importance of uh, racial discrimination in general, anti-black racial discrimination in this particular region. And I want to talk about the modalities, the ways in which that, that functions in a moment. So that's one set of questions, sort of what causes urban decline. The second was sort of what causes political conservatism. And I, I work in a field, uh, uh, geography, that some of you who are sort of professional geographers or social scientists may sort of, this may resonate with, um, that, um, you know, tries to answer questions like this in a, what we call very materialist terms. And the, the, the notion is that the rise of uh, certain forms of conservatism, particularly kind of what we would call economic conservatism or neoliberalism, market fundamentalism, this notion that everything should be deregulated, that governments are sort of always going to cause problems, and we should sort of, where does that idea come from? Um, is, is the notion that um, many, many scholars within geography and sociology argue that where these ideas um, emerged from was, was sort of economic crises from the 1970s. The notion was that emerging from the quote, World War II, uh, the United States and Canada had a kind of a period of 20 to 30 years where they were basically unchallenged economically in the world, the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, the global north anyway, was rebuilding from the war. Um, they, um, they had this sort of period of this kind of halcyon years of growth without much challenge. Their industry wasn't challenged. And then the 1970s hit. Uh, major indebtedness in both countries. There was um, uh, the, the American dollar to which uh, the, the Canadian economy is also very uh, uh, related, begins to sort of lose its power, lose its ascendancy. Um, the, the United States was sort of very much uh, in debt from the Vietnam War. And so there was this notion that the, the kind of period emerging from the 30s <coughs> through the 1970s uh, started to expire because the United States couldn't afford it, uh, that it was basically this Keynesian social democracy period this notion that um, you know of providing welfare, for building social housing, of using government in a kind of socially progressive way, expired when they effectively ran out of money and there was kind of an economic crisis. Once that occurred, then we start uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. You get sort of more conservative political figures kind of seize that moment and seize that crisis. You know, figures like Reagan and Thatcher and Mulroney, who sort of seize that moment and sort of uh, kind of exploit the tendencies and then sort of convert politics in a kind of more uh, conservative way. Um, my intervention is to sort of suggest um, that, that uh, well, I guess I would just say there's a couple problems with this before I get to sort of my intervention, which is, um, you know, one is that many of the ideas, if we're thinking about this as a sort of a shift in political terms, surely there must be some sort of political popularity to it. And the truth is, uh, at best, these notions of sort of market fundamentalism have a divided uh, uh, popularity. And I would argue that in many cases, they're not popular. Even conservative politicians, when it comes to very kind of pure market fundamentalist terms, like austerity, sort of cutting government, cutting welfare, cutting social insurance, all of these sorts of things, they tend not to boast about that on the campaign trail, right? Like these are not very popular things uh, to suggest. And when they uh, do have to sort of or do engage in these, they often do so in sort of uh, sideways ways. It's not terribly popular. It's also not terribly effective that the sort of austerity mechanism sort of taking over schools in the US, uh, uh, cutting uh, taxes and variety has rarely generated kind of fiscal solvency in, in, in the context to which it has been applied. So the question to me is sort of why, how can they persist if there is this sort of lack of efficacy or at least uneven record? Um, in more or less democratic systems, why would this idea suddenly become ascendant? And in, in particular, why after 2008, 2009, would it continue where there was the ideas of market fundamentalism were, were uh, shown to fail in, in such a, apocalyptic ways uh, at the global scale? So how can it persist um, within uh, more or less democratic systems? And the second um, issue uh, that I have with this, sort of this paradigm or this sort of notion of breaking up history in this way is that this notion relies exclusively on kind of what we would think of as conventional economics, conventionally economic crisis, conventionally, that, um, and the, to the notion that 
where class within this paradigm is the sort of primary axis of division within any given society. Um, and I would sort of in the, this this within this notion that this is why you know within this paradigm that this is why um, you know that, that the white working class, for example, in the United States now but votes Republican or is very conservative because this was this was this was sort of a paradigm that kind of shook up the kind of class order before. And I would sort of ask if it was so you know if this was if it's all about class, why was it if it was so sufficient in uh, driving the white working class away from the kind of Keynesian social democratic order? Why didn't uh, the, the non-white working class uh, find it as compelling as well? My feeling, and the, the theory I try to push forward in this book, is that um, the, the relationships, that, that, that these things are very real, that these sort of, and what I, rather than words like neoliberalism or, or deregulation, I'm using the language of what I call organized deprivation, and it's sort of the notion of, sort of trying to understand why, it, particularly in places like Detroit, like Cleveland, these very distressed places, these very visibly distressed places, why there is, uh, why that has occurred, and, and, and what are the forces driving it? And I, and um, more than these sort of theories that just sort of emphasize economics as sort of deindustrialization, um, it's my feeling that racial threat, racial the threat that uh, anti-black racial threat uh, that is, is sort of exercised by um, white people in in the American Midwest has had, a, in white institutions, has had a great deal to do with sort of creating the sort of things that we just kind of often reduce to sort of economic, um, economic matters. So a couple things, um, uh, again, the intervention is neoliberalism, austerity, penality, deprivation, whatever you want to call it, um, their parents are not simply economic crisis in the 1970s. The second is that what all of these forces are driven by racial threat in a variety of ways. Um, and it's, in, in my view, it's also, um, uh, useful to think of the conservative movement is not just sort of reducible to sort of it's all about government deregulation, there's other motivations for this kind of politics. To me, the declining city, places like Detroit, um, are both a consequence of policies motivated by such politics and a contorted idea uh, that is deployed in bad faith to advance such politics. And I want to talk about both of those uh, separately and, and maybe bring them back together at the end. Okay, so why would one, um, even sort of surmise that there is a kind of connection between racial threat and this notion of sort of, uh, you know, posing one group of people as a threat and therefore sort of reacting to them through uh, juridical policy mechanisms, policing, et cetera. Um, why would one sort of uh, connect these two things together? Well, I think the first reason one would connect these two things together in the American Midwest is um, the high correspondence between places that have lost a great deal of people, white, black, what, uh, whatever, uh, uh, all people, um, and investment, that is, that sort of uh, lost investment in, in, in housing and in a variety of different sources, are the places that are overrepresented by African American people in the region. And what you're looking at now is, is basically a, um, a, a sort of just kind of one representation of that. There's a couple of I'd like to share with you. This is just basically population change, probably the leading metric that um, is used to uh, describe uh, cities that are struggling. And um, the, basically, the, looking at the, the census tracts, which basically the neighborhood level at, uh, of, of all major cities in the American Midwest, um, in 1970 to 2010, looking at their population change, and sort of blue areas, what I want you to focus on, that these, these are the, uh, sense the neighborhoods that have experienced extreme population loss. And that basically the black majority neighborhoods in the region have experienced the greatest, we are overrepresented as, as sort of places that have lost a great deal of population, not just of, of uh, white individuals, but of all individuals uh, from those places. Uh, it is true that there are other regions that are white, other neighborhoods that are white, uh, majority that have experienced some population loss and in certain lo locations considerable population loss. But as we say, social scientists, uh, that the, uh, the focus of the loci of population loss is overrepresented in uh, black majority neighborhoods. Um, the second, um, my, the studies I've been doing recently actually try to focus, I think, not just on population loss. One thing I think is a particularly uh, revealing indicator of the of, of particularly the challenging forms of urban decline uh, is housing unit loss. So the number of houses that are literally missing that were once there uh, on in a neighborhood um, uh, in um, in a particular city. 
And in one of the studies I did that there's something like 270 or so neighborhoods in throughout the Midwest that have lost half or more of their housing. Imagine the street you grew up on, that if half or more of the housing uh, is, is gone, not just sort of like empty and vacant, about half of the remaining housing in those neighborhoods is also empty and, and vacant, but, but the housing is, is literally uh, not there anymore. And, I use this as an indicator of housing unit loss because it's very visible. You can see this, right? If half the housing is missing, you can see this, and very and it serves as a signal to potential people who want to maybe want to move into that neighborhood, investors in various uh, various sorts. Uh, it, but it's also very durable. It's unlikely that that's going to kind of reverse itself in in, in short uh, order. And so these tend to be kind of more kind of calcified versions of urban decline. In any case, if you sort of divide those neighborhoods into different levels of uh, uh, housing unit loss, and then just sort of look at the demographics in those neighborhoods. Um, that, again, this is the 25 largest cities uh, broken into census tracts and then sort of divided in this particular way. That again, the most extreme decline neighborhoods are also the places that are the most African American uh, before and after 1970 to 2010. Other ways to represent this, this is a map of planning study in the city of Cleveland. If anybody has ever been to the city of Cleveland or knows anything about the city of Cleveland, you know that the east side of the city, the city that um, uh, is, is the historically African-American half of the city, and it's that way because um, after the great migration of uh, black people uh, uh, from the American South, um, there was basically an apartheid-like setup uh, where they were permitted to live in American cities. In Cleveland, it happened to be on the east side of the city, and um, this is a map, a planning study, just in the sort of purple or sort of maroon, I guess, marks are the vacant lots in that particular city. You can see that there was vacant lots all over the city. It's a struggling city in a variety of sense, but they're overrepresented on the east side of the city. They're overrepresented um, on on that particular uh, side of the city. So. Um, the, the question to me, um, and, and this is, gives you some sense that, that these, um, you know, the, the question is sort of like, how do we understand this, right? Like if there is some sort of spatial relationship between the location of black, black populations and land vacancy, what would that relationship be? And again, this is, this is a photograph of the east side of Cleveland uh, looking toward downtown that sort of, that some, you can see these many gaps between the houses. What would that relationship be and what is the sort of prevailing theory? There's a couple of different paradigms. One is just simply ignoring it, to be honest. Most don't sort of focus on this. Most people who write about racial discrimination don't talk about housing unit loss or sort of population loss. They talk about sort of the, the, the kind of human rights dimension of racial discrimination, the, um, the, the, the impact, the unfairness of racial discrimination in the job market and housing market. But with not a lot of connection between these two. And when it comes to sort of uh, measuring, I would say maybe the, the, the most prevailing school of thought is to sort of avoid it altogether. There is a, a second school of thought that is actually a formal school of thought that is trying to address the relationship here. It's called racial proxy theory. And um, it is the notion, it's the, the notion that um, what we're seeing in these cases is basically a kind of tangible form of white flight in a sense that sort of white uh, people are sort of moving at the first sign of a uh, black family. But this particular theory is argued it has nothing to do with racism. It's that they, that these innocent white families view um, uh, black people as a proxy for coming urban decline and then sell their house and, and, and move uh, very quickly. I, I've never fully understood why that in and of itself isn't a form of racial discrimination, but it, be it as it may, it is a sort of, it is a school of thought within social science about sort of why there is this relationship. It also doesn't necessarily explain why there would be a movement of all people out of a neighborhood. It may explain why white people are fleeing a neighborhood. So I think it gets the expl explanation wrong, but it, but it still doesn't explain why there'd be overall population loss. Um, the third school of thought, and I want to sort of gesture to it here and then come back to it in a moment because I think that it's particularly uh, prevalent, is uh, a by conservative eco economists and think tank uh, folks who actually blame black people, right? Like that they actually view this relationship, they see, see the relationship, they see that there is, um, but they, they blame it on black people, on black leaders, that they scared off white people, they were um, vandalizing criminal uh, figures and that, 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 that they, they sort of destroyed these particular cities. And I sort of gestured to a, a few quotes here and I just want to sort of underline a couple of things about them. One is the sort of, uh, these are very, these are not sort of fringe figures that wear uh, clan hoods. These are, fringe, these are central figures in the field of economics who um, 
Uh, this, this one was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, George Stigler, who sort of basically blamed white flight on, 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 on black people in a variety of ways. More recently, uh, Harvard economist Ed Glazer uh, basically argued that one of the reasons you see this sort of decline in the relationship to black populations is that black leaders were overly militant. He has particular daggers for a person named Coleman Young, who was the first black mayor of Detroit. And, and I sort of uh, gesture to it to sort of, and I'm going to come back to it in a moment, because this paradigm, while I don't think it, it has uh, any sort of uh, academic value, to be honest, I, it, I, uh, it, there's a number of holes, and we can talk about what those are in a moment, um, it is very pre prevalent within conservative academia and certainly within conservative politics. The notion of why places like Detroit ended up the way that they did uh, is, is rooted in uh, a, a kind of form of racial animus in and of itself. And it's a very organized project by the by the conservative movement. So, with all of these theories, uh, whether they are the you know the kind of conservative propaganda or uh, racial proxy theory or even the sort of economic theories, I think that they all lack a kind of they, they have some limitations, and that's why I want to sort of make my um, own intervention here. One is that at best, at best, these theories explain why uh, white flight occurred, right? So, uh, but even if, it, even if they explain that, they don't explain why there would be overall population loss. They might explain why there would be the flight of white people, but they don't necessarily explain why there would be you know, the, the flight of, of hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, black people from an, an investment in places like Detroit. So they're very partial at best. Uh, the second is that they leave untouched an array of uh, evidence that I'll talk about in a moment on employment and housing discrimination, on over-policing, on neglect, that affect uh, wealth, income, and stability of black people, families, and neighborhoods differently than they do white people, family, and neighborhoods, um, and, and that this, this, this should be engaged with. And finally, this is something that I don't think is unique to this, this, this set of theories, but is, 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 a, is a challenge, is that these literatures all overemphasize, in, in my view, uh, the role that people living in and leading these cities have in whatever fortunes those cities have, and underemphasize the constraints placed on them by institutions, people, and forces outside of them. And I think this is particularly an issue in, in, in North America in general, where we often sort of think of sort of places as sort of um, in control of their own destinies, but it, you know, as a sort of basic legal matter, both in Canada and the United States, cities are creatures of the higher levels of government. And should those higher levels of government seek to sort of uh, limit the powers or limit the ability of those cities to sort of convert themselves into a post-industrial city or to sort of govern themselves, um, they can do a lot of damage. I want to explain some of the ways in which that has sort of occurred in the United States. So what's my intervention? If I have problems with these theories, what's my, uh, my um, intervention? And I talk about this in the first chapter of the book, is to suggest that there are five modalities or five pathways through which uh, racial discrimination helps facilitate the flight of capital and or people from urban space. That is to say that, that these forms of racial discrimination or racial animus uh, uh, accelerate other processes of urban decline or also create uh, new ones in and of themselves. And there's sort of five ways that this occurs in my view. The first is the sort of legacy effects of racial discrimination that was legal. So a, a formerly legal racial discrimination. So I know some of you were in the geography class, um, but uh, some of you uh, may not be familiar with some of the, 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 the terminology, but uh, some of the forms of racial discrimination that um, we know a great deal about because they were sort of legal and then made sort of <coughs> illegal in the 1960s and 1970s are things like redlining or banks basically just not uh, lending to particular neighborhoods or overpricing mortgages for, for particular neighborhoods. Um, uh, contract mortgages were sort of buyer to seller contracts which were very exploitative uh, that didn't result in, in um, uh, equity for, for people in, the, in, in those situations. Block busting, it's a form of uh, uh, real estate, uh, re re realtors sort of exploiting um, white fear of black uh, in, in movement, buying houses at, on the cheap and then selling them to black families uh, more expensively. Uh, to sort of exploit this in, in a variety of other sort of uh, racial rental discrimination, racial discrimination uh, in the housing sector. All of these were not only legal but common uh, before 1968. And so the notion is that sort of like the, these uh, that these forms that limited capital, that broke the housing stock, that broke the housing economy, that affected people in very uneven ways, these were racially targeted acts, were only made illegal 50 years ago, 
And many would argue that all of the acts that were that, that targeted them were pretty weak to begin with, and so they, they didn't even effectively uh, you know, uh, overturn them. But the, the, the notion is that this, the damage was done. The damage was done, that there's a kind of legacy effect, that that's why we see this kind of unevenness across the landscape that is overlaps the black population, because that's where the black population lived before, and the black population was uh, the populations in, in those cities were targeted by these, these racially discriminatory acts which damaged the housing market. And this is just sort of an example. In Detroit, the two maps you see on the one on the left is the sort of the redlining map. These are sort of famous maps that were made in the 1930s in the United States uh, that kind of mapped some of the neighborhoods that were, I think it's actually much worse than this, but that, that were um, you know, the, the places that banks basically refused to, to lend to. Uh, the, the, the map on the right is one that I made of the, uh, the extreme housing loss neighborhoods in Detroit today. That is this, this, the neighborhoods since 1970 that have lost more than half of their housing. So there's a big gap in there, but this is the notion that those housing stocks, those particular locations were the most damaged, and that's one of the reasons we see the close correspondence, just kind of contemporary uh, urban decline, even if there was these acts before. The second modality um, is, is much more visceral, it's much more basic, it's much more, um, uh, it's, it's much simpler in some ways, and that is just simply white refusal, ongoing white refusal of uh, white residents to live in black majority neighborhoods. And why that sort of impacts the, 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 those neighborhoods in particular, and how it impacts them. I was sort of point to, there's a couple different ways to talk about this, and I do, I do talk about it in some of the studies that I posted on my website and posted, and I'd be happy to talk more about it. But one of the interesting things that I, I think um, that uh, social psychologists find, we often think of white flight and white resistance to living in a majority non-white environments as kind of a, as sort of an act of, or sort of a process of history, or so that, that was sort of an issue in the post-war period, but that's not as much a problem now. The truth is that in, in co contemporary studies that there's continued refusal, uh, both in sort of in practice, but also even in, in survey form. And there's a, 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 a even uh, granting a willingness to even visit certain neighborhoods. There's a series of uh, famous studies done by uh, University of Michigan, University of Illinois, Chicago, Harvard University professors. That they do these surveys where they're fascinating studies, they're social psychologists, and they they ask respondents of different ethno-racial backgrounds to indicate their willingness to live in certain kinds of neighborhoods in these kind of very simple terms. So this is an example of one that was done at the University of Michigan and up into the 1990s, where they ask white residents to sort of indicate their willingness to live in a neighborhood, a hypothetical neighborhood. The, the X box was, is basically the neighbor, the, to their imagined house and the ethno-racial relationship of the neighbors around them. So white residents, the first box would be sort of an all-white neighborhood, uh, and then sort of progressively more integrated neighborhoods. And in these studies, they, they consistently, to this day, find these exact same things, which is that white residents continually I express an unwillingness to even visit many sort of 50-50 neighborhoods or to even marginally integrated neighborhoods, much less live in those neighborhoods. And these methods, these kinds of methods, likely grossly understate the actual willingness because of what's something called social desirability bias, which is the bias that people don't want to be called a racist, so they, so they sort of mask how much they actually are unwilling to live in, in, in such environments. Even with that bias, um, there, the, there is a, a, a repeated um, pattern, right, of uh, white uh, residents refusing to take up residence in the most African-American spaces. Now, that, that may not be a, much of an issue in a city that has very few non-white people and that there isn't sort of much um, of an impact on the overall, uh, on the overall sort of pattern, uh, but in places like Detroit or Cleveland where the 50%, 60%, 70%, 80% black, uh, that there are many, there are hundreds of neighborhoods in those cities that are 95% black, right? Uh, that it becomes uh, the, 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 the damage done when the majority population, the white population, is still the majority population in every state in the, mid, in, uh, in, in the Midwest. If the majority population is collectively <laughs> deciding that there is not going to be, that they're not going to be solid with or school, be schooled with African American people to this day, it of course has a catastrophic dem, uh, impact on demand for housing in precisely those locations. What I'm showing you now is basically a pattern of the neighborhoods in Detroit, and this is just one of the cities that I've studied in the, in the book, but I do come back to it because it's so iconic. Um, over time, of 
the neighborhoods in the 1970s that experienced an influx of 500 or more African American people at the neighborhood level. And as you can see, the first few decades, there's two patterns that occur, is one that it becomes almost entirely black very quickly, that is to say almost all white people move out. Uh, but the population change or in the first few decades some is, is, is relatively marginal. It's often less than the rest of the city. It's only after a few decades where this becomes an issue. And the reason it becomes an issue is that the initial black in-migrants have no one to sell their house to. White people refuse to buy houses in those locations. And so um, it, it then in those neighborhoods, then uh, urban decline becomes even more acute and becomes more effective o over time. So there's this ongoing refusal that I think is is, is, has to be sort of pointed to. The third issue, uh, the third reason that there might be this overlap, or that there is this overlap in my view, is something I would call the kind of political redlining of the black city. Um, some of you may, or sort of students of American history may un, uh, know about the sort of Great Migration. The Great Migration was basically a movement of uh, white and black people from the American South fleeing the kind of agricultural sector to uh, more abundant jobs in the kind of industrial north. Um, the first half of it sort of began in this kind of early 20th century. The second half extended into the sort of 1960s, in some cases in the 1970s. Um, but the, the first half was more white, the second half was more black, and there's reasons for why, the, why that was the case. But it was very uneven. It wasn't that sort of every city in the uh, United States then developed a 40% black population, or, or uh, you know, in, just in the Midwest, for example, some cities like Duluth and Scranton, uh, even to this day, have very, very few black people that, that or non-white people in general, that live in the in those cities. Whereas pl places like Gary, Indiana, uh, Detroit, Highland Park, Michigan, these are places that are 85% or more African American, so they became black majorities. And in those black majority cities, they started to elect black mayors and uh, city council people. Um, in the 1960s, something that um, was, was very much a lot of by civil rights activists is sort of a, a, a very progressive thing that many people were fleeing disenfranchisement uh, in the American South and they thought that this was going to sort of positively impact uh, African American lives as they sort of moved, moved to the American North. Um, but this was quickly dashed and I think the, the, a number of scholars have pointed out that the willingness, the willingness of uh, firms and uh, higher levels of government to cooperate with City Hall evaporated the second that that City Hall began to be headed by uh, African American um, uh, mayors uh, and city council people. And um, this is extraordinarily important, particularly at turning a corner. Scholars have pointed out that you know just because a, a city um, loses much of its manufacturing employment doesn't mean it's dead. Many cities never had a manufacturing economy. Others were able to retain manufacturing employment. Still others were able to convert their economy, uh, similar to, to Toronto, into a very post-industrial economy. So banking sector, service sector, all of these sorts of things. Whatever the turn, it, if one is going to be successful, so the city is going to be successful at making that turn, it relies on decisions by firms and higher levels of government. And in the, in the cases of uh, black majority cities, there was a palpable lack of willingness um, to buy firms at higher levels of government to work with work with the city in question. The fourth area I think affects individuals, or we often think of it as a kind of issue of individual unfairness, um, uh, and it is uh, in a human rights issue, and it is. But it's also an issue that um, um, has enormous impacts on the sort of uh, again the ability of cities to retain wealth and weather reform, whether that is to suit through simple wages or or population stability. Um, uh, in a very uneven way, and that is what is sort of maybe indelicately described as the criminalization of blackness. And I use that phrase because um, in the United States, the two major upticks in sort of inc incarceration, um, and the United States incarcerates everybody at, at great, greater rates than almost any comparable society, including ours, um, and throughout the world, but particularly uh, over-incarcerates African-American people and African-American men uh, in, in, in particular. And they, they're, they're, uh, historians have pointed out that the two major upticks in the incarceration wave came in two moments. One is the Reconstruction period, uh, initially uh, right after the Civil War, so after abolition of slavery, and uh, criminalizing all sorts of activities, particularly though not exclusively in the American South. And the second was right after the Civil Rights Movement, particularly after the uprisings in cities and in, the, in, in the American North. And um, on all levels of government, local, state, federal, there has been an incarceration machine, right? A, a, a 
dealing with every social problem through um, arrests and through um, kind of over policing. And this has particularly targeted black neighborhoods, black people, black cities in, in, in very, very uneven ways. And, um, and, and is dealt with in, in particular ways. And I would say that there, there was, there's a lot that could be said about this, and I do talk about it more in the book. I would just simply point that its impact on urban decline, that is the sort of ability of cities to sort of retain people, to retain investment, to retain high incomes or stable incomes, is fundamentally undermined when a substantial portion of the population is on probation or has criminal records because that very much inhibits your ability to rent in the formal sector, to get a, uh, a job in the formal sector. It undermines in very spatially uneven ways, in ethno-racially specific ways, um, the ability of, of people to sort of uh, have stability in their lives. And given the segregated nature of American cities, even to this day, that by definition affects certain places more than others, places that are vast majority African Americans and whose uh, social problems have been dealt with through uh, this kind of criminality lens um, have more damaged populaces when it comes to sort of their ability to sort of uh, provide um, income uh, means. And most of the time, conservatives, all, as I'll talk about this, scoff at this notion of sort of a left-wing conspiracy theory. Every once in a while, particularly uh, as Nixon administration figures are, are on their deathbeds, uh, will come up with uh, Quotes where they basically admit that this was that this was the approach that this was this was a sort of a dog whistled way of sort of uh, responding to white fears about uh, black municipal ascendance in a variety of ways. The sixth, the fifth um, modality um, is is simple, and that is just simply the ongoing forms of racial discrimination in the job and housing sector, and how that sort of impacts in very spatially uneven ways. Um, I talked about this for the students who were here, and I gave a lecture earlier today. <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the study by Diva Pager, who was a sociologist at Harvard, who I think did this fascinating study to highlight racial discrimination. If you interview, for example, employers and say, do you racially discriminate? Of course, almost every single one is going to say no for legal and social desirability reasons. But um, there is this sort of family of methods within sociology called audit studies. And audit studies basically consist of hiring two people who are actors, effectively called testers, and they're, they're often the most common design is to sort of hire a, uh, a white couple and a black couple or hire a white man and a black man to sort of apply for jobs or to, uh, to get, uh, try to get a mortgage and then sort of record differences in how they're treated. She, uh, Diva Pager, did a study in um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, as part of her dissertation about almost 20 years ago in which she uh, hired a black, a young black man and a young white man to apply for entry-level employment so in, 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 uh, on a variety of jobs, so hotels, restaurants, these sorts of things, um, in the service sector. And then they basically had identical uh, resumes in terms of qualifications. Uh, but she uh, switched up. In some cases, she had this sort of fictitious identity. She gave one of them a criminal record and one of them not. And in some cases, that was the black man. In some cases, that was the white man. And she found these sort of fascinating. The, the figure on the left kind of illustrates the kind of main finding that's been brought up in sort of political conversations in a, in a variety of contexts, which is that, that um, you know, everyone with a criminal record um, uh, is, is sort of called back much, much less for an interview for a job, which isn't terribly surprising. But what was a bit, a, a bit more uh, surprising was that um, white people with ostensibly a criminal record were called back more often than black people without a criminal record. That is, that this was ongoing racial discrimination. And uh, the reason I point this out, I mean, again, there's human rights dimensions, this is fairness dimensions, this. But the, the most basic, when we talk about these abstractions like investment in a city or, or uh, why people move to a particular uh, place or move away from a particular place, it's often for very basic you know, material reasons, right? Like your ability to secure a high wage, your ability, your access to capital is often through the wage system. And um, the, that wage system access is fundamentally more inhibited or discriminated uh, uh, some groups are discriminated more than others in this, and um, given again the segregated nature of American cities, that th that you have, you know, a place like Detroit, which is pictured on on the right, um, that is 80 percent African American, but its suburbs are, are something like that uh, uh, in in percent white. That this is going to these forms of discrimination are going to by definition impact uh, the, not just individuals but places very very unevenly. So the bottom line with this, it's sort of like, what, what is this overlap, in my view, in very material terms, kind of thinking about why there's this kind of over, overlap of sort of black population, black people, black coding, and on the one hand, and urban decline on the other, 
is, is sort of these, these, these uh, five modalities. Um, the bottom line to me is if we accept that anti-black discrimination still exists, uh, and I'm not sure what's debatable about that, um, uh, and that black, the black population remains highly concentrated in cities and the region, and if you look just very briefly at this map, um, the, the black population in the American Midwest, unlike the American South, is almost exclusively concentrated in large cities. Um, in other parts of the country, uh, there are very po uh, large uh, black populations at all. In the Midwest, uh, the Rust Belt, there are basically uh, black population concentrations only in cities. And so therefore, it's not much of a leap of faith in my view to argue that what affects black people also affects black neighborhoods and cities. Uh, the second is that I think that the construction of blackness as a threat to white political interests, property, and safety is a key independent force and an accelerant of other forces driving urban decline. And so I think of these things as interrelated, not just as historical matters, but as very much ongoing. Now, the second half, and again, these are the two things, sort of what causes urban climate, what causes political conservatism, and I'll bring them back together very briefly at the end. The second half is sort of uh, thinking about cities a little bit differently, and that is, um, we can think about cities as sort of filled with buildings and people and processes and infrastructure and all these kinds of very tangible items, uh, but cities are also ideas. They're things, but they're also ideas. They're, they're things we have in our imagination. We think about Vancouver in a certain way. We think about Toronto in a certain way, sometimes pejorative, sometimes not. Uh, and and the, the, that idea is sort of influenced by a variety of different forces. And um, basically, the, the second half of this book is really looking at the role that um, the kind of constructed version of places of, of the black city, of the black neighborhood, have had in the American psyche and how that sort of motivated a certain kind of politics. And I would suggest that that sort of timeline that I talked about a moment with, that, that caused this kind of shift in political fortunes or political alliances within the United States is a bit off, that there was a bit, big shift in the mid 20th century that took um, the, the populace uh, away from kind of the Keynesian social New, New Deal uh, order, but it wasn't exclusively about economic crisis in the 1970s, it was about racial realignment on a variety of different levels. And I want to talk about the role that um, the uh, black spaces and this kind of construction and deployment of black spaces had in that. So let, let's talk about the backdrop uh, for, for a second, that just to kind of some basic history behind this. Um, so in the 1960s, a great deal of racial tumult in the United States. So this is the end of the Great Migration. Most black people until the sort of 1930s lived in the American South. Um, in, in the 1960s, it was a great deal of racial conflict uh, culminating in a number of things. Um, uh, including sort of major uprisings in uh, several hundred American cities in 1964, 65, 67, and 68, particularly in 1967, though. Uh, many, many were there, and that, that there was a famous report, the Kerner Commission report was done of this uh, to sort of excavate sort of what, what are some of the reasons for, for this. But these, um, this was, uh, these were in cities, right, all, in all of these locations, in Detroit and Cincinnati and Cleveland. These were places where um, had, in a generation, a very quick generation, went from being virtually all white cities uh, with class distinction, class differences, I don't want to suggest they were sort of identical, uh, but uh, with very small black populations to having very large populations and obviously major, major conflict within a very short period of time. Um, the, in, so throughout the 1960s, it was kind of division that was occurring on a variety of different levels. Um, another force that was happening in the, in, in the United States, this was the Democratic Party, which sort of you know, uh, uh, pushed through the New Deal, was sort of responsible for the kind of Keynesian social democratic order that we think of in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, spearheaded the civil rights movement, basically the, the major acts in 1964, 65, 68, and then uh, a few in the 1970s that were more minor. Uh, and these acts were basically trying to sort of remedy uh, racial discrimination in the United States. Um, and they um, paid an enormous political price, particularly, in the, but not exclusively, in the American South. That we, t this is, you know, a, lot, a great deal of history that's been written about, you know, the impact of, you know, the, the American South, which used to be uh, almost exclusively Democratic Party voting, uh, voting, because the Democratic Party was pretty racist and and, and was in fact at the time um, uh, instituted a number of racially discriminatory measures in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, and the, it kept Southern Democrats in order. Anyway, one outcome of this was that um, uh, there was a great deal of disaffection of kind of, uh, ref kind of refugee Southern Democrats, one of whom was named George Wallace, some of you, you know, 
heard of this name, and this was a person who ran for president. He was a former uh, governor in the South, and um, he ran for president of the United States several times, but his most successful run was in 1968. And he won five southern states as an independent, although he was a former Democrat. He was running on an openly segregationist line. He was basically running against his own former party for its perceived transgressions of embracing civil rights and embracing a kind of more racial equality. Um, and it paid uh, enormous dividends in the American South. Like I said, he won five southern states, which was pretty enormous at the time. What is less discussed about him, George Wallace that is, is that he won pretty sizable numbers in the American North, but in very, very uneven ways. Um, he won um, in areas around uh, the cities to which African American people had, had moved which is interesting a little bit against the kind of conventional wisdom. We often think about figures like that. We think about figures like Trump as appealing primarily to this kind of white, angry, uh, racially uh, toxic kind of um, a rural uh, a white voter, and I suppose he does, but it, the real shift in fortunes, political fortunes, why that sort of shift from one paradigm to the other occurred, occurred in the suburbs surrounding, not in the sort of white rural areas, which had generally been Republican uh, uh, for years, but recur occurred in the sort of areas around uh, the sub in the suburbs of Cincinnati, the suburbs of Columbus, where I grew up, the suburbs of uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And so Republicans saw this, right? Republicans had a very kind of, and, and, and didn't quite know how to, to, to deal with it uh, in, um, at first, but they, they began, and starting with Nixon, uh, who didn't quite know how to manage it in 1968 when he first won uh, the presidency, but very much mastered it in 1972, to devise what was called dog whistling, or Southern strategy. And these were messaging techniques that were designed, and again, another Nixonite on his deathbed, so he admits some extra little thing, uh, sort of an archive for historians. Uh, this is Lee Otter, but um, they, they basically figured out ways of weaponizing racial resentment. And one of their main concerns was that they would like to gesture to these sorts of, uh, these perceived abuses by the Democratic Party, or, uh, but do so in a way that wouldn't alienate uh, what they saw as sort of uh, Republican moderates, white people living in the suburbs, who might not be turned on or might, might find that kind of politics untoward or toxic and, and, and not very attractive, and therefore it might turn votes away. And so they devised this coding dog whistle, this notion of a, 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 you know, a, a whistle that two uh, sets of ears can hear at two different frequencies. Uh, for one set of ears, it was to sort of animate that angry, racially resentful white person from the South and rural Ohio and places like this who voted for uh, uh, you know, Wallace, and, uh, uh, but also uh, had embedded with it a kind of plausible deniability, right? Like that, that, that others could use to say deny that, that it had anything to do with race. And so this group, uh, two of whom are now in prison, uh, Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, who are pictured here in their younger years uh, before they went to prison, um, are, uh, they devised this. These are sort of the Republican hatchet men, um, starting with Reagan, and various Republican figures since then have learned how to do this in a variety of ways. One of the most direct instances of invoking the literal kind of uh, declining city occurred in 1980. We often talk about Nixon in this way, although all of those figures, the, the group Manafort, Atwater, uh, Roger Stone, have worked for all of the Republican uh, presidential uh, eventual nominees uh, <coughs> since then, including Trump. That's why they're in jail. The two of them is because they were they finally crossed the line with with, with Trump. But that they've been doing this for years. They've been sort of these hatchet men. And one of the things was to sort of like figure out ways of animating this racial animus in again plausibly denial ways. One of the more famous instances of this occurred, uh, or early instances that occurred in 1980 uh, with uh, Ronald Reagan, where he sort of direct invocation of a uh, uh, distressed urban space. This is him standing in the South Bronx on a street called Charlotte Street. Um, and he uh, he went there, and I don't know how many people remember this, this was my earliest political memory, that I didn't, uh, I was sort of confused to sort of watching this on, on one of the networks, there was only three networks at the time, and um, wondering why, you know, why he would, he went to this neighborhood and was sort of jeered and um, people were not friend, receptive to what he was saying because he was basically arguing that he was going to offer nothing when he became president to this, to this place. And even the reporters asked his handlers, why would you, why would you send your candidate into this, this place where they were not, were not popular? And they responded with this, that Mr. Reagan's efforts could help his attempt to widen his appeal amongst other 
elements of the electorate, such as liberal and moderate suburban Republicans. The notion was that this sort of performance of concern uh, goes a long way at sort of like tying together the conservative coalition that, um, um, you know, that, that, that certainly was sort of burgeoning at the time. And this has certainly continued, um, most recently with the current president of the United States, this kind of back and forth which means both pathologizing black spaces on the one hand and showing a kind of, uh, a kind of feigned uh, concern for conditions in those locations. So even Trump, who seems to have replaced the dog whistle with a bullhorn, has still actually invoked this kind of performance of concern. This, this quote on, on the left is actually a, um, is, is a quote from one of his 2016 rallies where he's sort of conveying this sort of like uh, concern and he was doing it to an all white audience. He's not sort of trying to get black votes, he's trying to sort of, um, in, the, in this particular method, invoke the black city, invoke black pathology, invoke black criminality as a sort of thing that needs to be um, uh, con concerned and, and worrying again to one set of viewers, but also something that kind of feigns concern that he might actually do something about this on, in another set of viewers. Um, and so, um, this, uh, th this, this, this basic relationship, I, I think it is, is not just sort of a political technique by a few uh, Republican uh, candidates, it's up and down the, and side to side in the conservative movement food chain. Institutions, uh, uh, you know, think tanks are overly obsessed with uh, explaining uh, the sort of failure of Detroit despite its relative size in the United States. Um, uh, the conservative media, Fox News in particular, is obsessed with criminality in Chicago and Detroit and these, these sorts of things in ways that sort of outstrip their actual occurrence. And then of course, and most toxically, um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, social media, conservative social media, which is just a sort of toxic hellscape right now of, of invocations of a variety of different sort of elements, including uh, pathologizing the black city. What has been the impact of this? Well, um, political scientists have noted the increasing correspondence of voting Republican, particularly in the mid American Midwest and American South, and whiteness, of liberal whiteness and uh, white racial resentment. This is something that I sort of have in the book, which is just basically the correlation of the association between the percent white and voting uh, Democratic in a particular county in the American Midwest, and it's become particularly since the 1960s, a sort of widened gap that basically there was not much of a relationship before. Now there is, that is to say that the places that are voting Republican and voting, increasing voting Republican are the whitest spaces in the American Rust Belt. The places that are not voting Republican, places of voting Democrat are the, the cities, basically the cities that, that are uh, the, the, the blackest spaces in, in, in those locations. And, and so um, this, this has occurred, in, and sorry, I would also note that um, political scientists have also done very careful survey data where they, they do kind of exit polls and they ask people this sort of questions about sort of, uh, you know, to kind of gauge their kind of level of racial resentment and put that on sort of Likert scales and um, have noted that there's sort of an increasing uh, association between what we think of as conservatism and kind of uh, racial resentment, of racial threat um, on a variety of different levels. Now again, the prevailing wisdom of this on a spatial level is that most of this is coming from white morality. If anybody follow the New York Times and sort of that sort of uh, you know even follow the locations of where Trump gives his rallies, it's often in very rural locations. The the thinking is that the prevailing kind of even to this day uh, thinking is that the, um, the 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 white morality is where that you're going to find this kind of activity. Um, the cities in the Midwest are the places where there are more multicultural, or at least less white, and so they're going to have a different kind of politics. And the suburbs are going to be this kind of moderating force. And this, 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 um, uh, this, this basic assumption. This is actually a quote from 2016 that Senate Majority Leader, or Minority Leader, I guess he hopes he's Majority Leader one day, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, was arguing when he was asked about Hillary Clinton not being very popular in kind of rural white areas of the Midwest. He said doesn't matter, we're gonna pick up votes in the white suburbs that for the very reasons that Atwater and the Republican uh, consultants thought that this toxic guy, Trump, is gonna scare them off with his like, this, his racial um, uh, toxicity, the way he talks about non-white people, and this is gonna scare uh, people off. But it didn't then, and it, did, and it hasn't since. Um, and it's, it's in, in my view, it's, 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 it's actually an overstatement to suggest that that's where the shift has occurred. The shift um, has occurred in, in uh, my view, in the area, in the most important shift has occurred toward republicanism since the civil rights movement in the suburbs surrounding 
uh, the most uh, African American spaces, uh, black cities in, in places like Ohio. What I'm showing you here is basically something called a scatter plot, where on the, the horizontal axis is the uh, votes, uh, percentage votes for Democratic candidates in the 1932 to um, a 1944 period. Um, and uh, the uh, vertical axis is uh, per vote percentages for um, uh, Democratic presidential candidates in 1972 to 2016. Basically, if you look at the 45 degree line, the, the further they are beneath the 45 degree line, the more they've headed toward Republicanism, that is the voting uh, Republicans. So you see in general, Democrats have a serious problem in places like Ohio um, in a general sense. But what I've sort of isolated in the sort of red dots are the places that are suburbs, right? Like these are suburbs, and there's two dimensions here, both that, that these are not sort of these bastions of tolerance. The Republican Party has basically been saying economically throughout the 20th century to present what have changed is sort of their attitudes and policies about race, racial animus, um, in a variety of different levels, and the, the zone of shift, the shift toward those politics is not uh, being mitigated or, or, or mediated by the suburbs, but it's in fact being driven by them, right? That there is a great deal of this, this um, uh, racial animus that's in the suburbs around Columbus, around Detroit, around uh, Chicago, and um, this very much goes into what uh, uh, um, a sociologist called group uh, threat theory. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that in a moment. Okay, so I want to just finish up with um, uh, the title of the, uh, the, the concluding chapter of the book, and it's called Urban Decline is Plan. And it's basically, it's a knockoff of the uh, title that, or a phrase that the famous social theorist Carl Pollyanni wrote in his book, The Great Transformation in 1944. Carl Pollyanni was a social theorist. He actually lived in Ontario, but he worked at Columbia University, he had to live in Ontario because the Americans denied he and his wife residence because they thought his wife was a communist, so he had to live and basically commute to New York um, um, every, I guess every uh, uh, week or so. But um, he wrote this book, The Great Transformation, and it was about the ways in which uh, conservatives, we called them classical liberals at the time, in the 19th, uh, in sort of late 18th and uh, 19th and early 20th century, kind of governed places like Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, and they argued that uh, the, the market was kind of a natural order, right? It was a natural order, and that all of these things that we tried to do to sort of stop things like child labor or um, you know, uh, the, the ravages of industry or the, the, or the other health crises, these were sort of things that were disrupting the market. They argued in vehemently so, and they had a great deal of influence in all of the legislatures uh, and, and, and as academic theorists, and particularly in the field of economics, it's sort of arguing, as do modern conservatives, that these are um, any intervention, any regulation is going to lead to sort of unintended consequences. And so uh, the, the, the best thing for the state is to sort of let that natural order occur. And he used this, they, they, they were proponents of what's called laissez-faire economics. And he argued, uh, Carl Pollyanni argued that this was just complete bunk, that, that this notion there is no natural order to things. And he, and he uh, spent m much of the book just sort of explaining the ways in which government was used to impose this, what he called a free market utopia. That it was, that laissez-faire, hands-off economics, was not hands-off, it was in fact, it required a state, required policy, required all sorts of interventions <coughs> that sort of per perpetuated it, created it, and, 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 and um, created it in a variety of different ways. I would submit, sort of in closing, that we can think of uh, urban decline as planned in, in precisely the same ways, or in certain comparable ways. And that there are at least three or four ways, and I talk more about this in the book if you're more interested in some of these details, but there's sort of several forms of planning that I think are particularly important to point out. One is that there are acts that clearly target cities or the residents for perceived abuses. Uh, the state of Michigan is hostile to the city of Detroit. The state of Ohio is hostile to the city of uh, Cleveland. Uh, those states preempt or overturn minimum wage increases. They, they stop, they remove certain economic development capacities. Uh, they, they refuse to help cities unless they bow to conservative orthodoxy. Uh, and I provide a number of examples of that in the case. The second form of this kind of planning are sort of juridical legacies. We do it as much here in Canada as we do in the United States that we kind of uncritically accept as kind of political reality, that they're kind of like almost part of the natural order. Uh, in the United States, the inability of cities to annex their adjacent suburbs, the geography of school boundaries, the ways that schools are funded, deference to private property, the emphasis on incarceration, these are all seen as kind of like un immutable political realities, but they're very planned interventions. They're things that require politics and institution, 
and um, they all impact uh, the fortunes of, of cities. And finally, um, I would also add to this kind of topology, kind of acts of common purpose. Uh, and, and in particular, the, the acts of white people moving at the first sign of a black family, moving um, in, to live in their neighborhood. There was a common construction of black people as a danger to the investment of white people, common actions and institutions that organize uh, these actions. I would say in general and in closing, none of these acts are natural, organic, inevitable, or even successful on their own terms. They are coordinated political acts, and they have, uh, and they have and the impact, among other outcomes, of accelerating urban decline. If there is a solution to this problem, it surely lies more in addressing and challenging the political nature of the decline-inducing interventions than relatively superficial gestures like leaving or cleaning up vacant lots that are themselves constrained by, uh, from being at the scale of the problem. The answer in closing is political, uh, not technical. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. I think you gave us quite a lot of concepts to think about, and I think also very relevant to what we are experiencing in big cities, also small cities maybe. So uh, thank you very much. So we have now about um, 20, 25 minutes for questions um, from the audience. So, your turn. Can whites who come to see the end of your capital? Mm -hmm. Could you repeat the question? Uh, he asked, can whites who come see the end of under capitalism? So he asked, can white supremacy be ended under capitalism? And I'm stumbling because I don't know. And I do think that um, capitalism relies on othering, it relies on differentiation, it relies on a, not only racialization, but I do think that that is a form of it. Um, I am, uh, I, I certainly don't think capitalism will lead to it by itself. I do, it, it, if there is a way, it, it, it would, uh, be outside of the the bounds of uh, the internal processes of capitalism. So uh, I guess I'm skeptical that uh, I, cer I certainly think that there are a number of kind of conservative economists who argue that not only will it, but if we f free the market of regulation, that it will actually uh, lead to this sort of racially um, I I equal um, uh, society. I don't I don't think that makes any sense at all. But I I, I do think if there is a resolution uh, or a puncturing of white supremacy um, uh, adjacent to capitalism is not going to be because of capitalism. So I don't know if I have a better answer to that, but I, I do think that one of the, the interesting books written about this, um, at least one of it, is uh, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, I think is one of the most fascinating books about questions adjacent to this. Uh, I don't know that he would have an answer to that either, but it's, uh, it's, it's a very good question. I don't At the beginning, you uh, drew a contrast between some places where urban decline was very marked and other places where it wasn't yeah. as marked as, as in places like Cleveland and Detroit. But in most of your talk, you talk very generally yeah. about these patterns. And can you say something about um, maybe the exceptions to the rule that? You're talking about in city, American cities where that haven't experienced this kind of decline. What's the explanation? Well, I think that um, th at least those that began with industrial economies, I think that at least the the thinking is. And I do talk a bit about this. I certainly teach about this. That there's a number of um, maybe one of the best books I've read about this particular question is sort of is a book by uh, Sean Safford about, that compares Allentown, which has done pretty well, excuse me, and has been able to create a post-industrial economy and compares it to Youngstown, which has collapsed. It's gone off the, you know, it's, it's fell, fallen off a cliff. And um, he uh, notes, right, that the, in, you know, they basically started in the same place in the 1950s, and one ended up in one set of conditions, one and one and, and not, that the, the kind of necessary condition to, 
um, convert, at least to, to, to convert into a post-industrial economy, is sort of complicated investments by elites in that city, whether they're elected officials or, or the owners of firms, to invest in new kinds of, uh, of industries. And um, he likens it that sort of, at least in his view, that, that, that the reason Allentown, in, the, in this particular question, and places that have been able to convert this, had a more kind of socially invested elite. I think he's sort of half right about this, and I do think that the places that have been able to sort of either mitigate their industrial job sector losses or create new uh, industries are the places where there has been some sort of elite investment, often more by the state or uh, reforms of the state than, than by other uh, forms of capital. But that I, I think that um, the, those places are overwhelmingly white. So I'm thinking of places like Scranton, of Allentown, of Green Bay, of, of Duluth. Those are the exceptions. They were just as industrial and remained, or were just as industrial as Detroit in the mid 20th century. And in fact, were actually um, often more reliant on one particular like main, uh, uh, plant, uh, but uh, had an elite or had, had investments were not sort of targeted by by, by state by state actors. I don't. I also don't want to romanticize. I'm from, uh, the, um, you know, Ohio as I mentioned, in a, in a fairly white part of Ohio, and that you know there was, there's a great deal of struggle in, in certain locations in in towns that still have very you know small numbers of non-white people. This doesn't explain every element of, of urban decline uh, in in that region or, or or any other region. But I think that the the depth and the um, and the difficulty of making a turn out of an industrial economy has been um, particularly acute in places where um, there is a kind of white reactive uh, response to uh, black political ascendance, black demographic ascendance in, in, in a particular city, at least um, in, in the region. I would also point that, um, and it's true, I talk in very general terms in this kind of, um, this kind of lecture format, but I have uh, tried to measure this in more kind of uh, specific ways to sort of like associate levels of manufacturing job loss, uh, compare them to sort of outcomes like population loss and uh, uh, housing unit loss and a few of the papers. So if you want to email me, I'd be happy to email uh, some of those uh, papers to you where it gives you kind of a specific sense, okay, this set of cities dropped at, at least at this level. Um, the, city, the cities were able to kind of convert into a different kind of economy. But I think a lot of it has to do with kind of social relationships, and I think those social relationships were, were particularly um, undermined in places where uh, white supremacy was effectively challenged, I think, by, by a growing black population. Um, so I've... Uh I, I've lived in Victoria for my whole life, and I'm not sure how much you 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 know or how, how, many, how long you've been in Victoria. Uh, my second before. time here, so I don't know a lot about it. Okay, so I, I think it's safe to say one of the things about Victoria that is really distinctive is that there's this really extreme clash of really energetic young progressivism with a lot of um, sort of the relative equivalent of like the suburban republicanism um, of older groups that you're talking about. Here and it's just in in many ways, when it, especially when it comes to issues like housing and um, those types of things, there's a very much like a cultural clash um, in Victoria. And I think one of the things that I've noticed a lot in the last few years with the progressivism is it's become very bipartisan and very one-sided. And we tend to, in a lot of our discourse, we talk about people like the oil patch workers and um, steel workers, coal miners, the people that would support uh, people like Trump and maybe Andrew Scheer. We sort of look at them as, oh, they're just uneducated. They don't really, you know, they, they have no idea what's going on. But I, what, what you're showing here is that these people have almost been sort of very slowly led to, um, to the values that they have now um, over, you know, several decades. Um, almost like, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like they're almost like frogs that have been placed in boiling water. Mm -hmm. I can't speak to the issue here as, mu as much, but I, I think about this issue a great deal, and I come from people that are, I think, you know, we as social scientists, we use this phrase, false consciousness, this notion that sort of they're, they're sort of being duped or something. And, um, uh, and I, I don't know, I, I think maybe the more depressing possibility is that they know exactly what they're doing, and that this, it's, 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 just, it's just a kind of meaner conclusion. 
And um, I, I certainly think the, the place that where I grew up that, that um, um, where you know pe people have been voting that it's not sort of a new found thing or they've not been sort of like convinced by a turn of phrase by Trump or but that um, as sort of social scientists like to say they're sort of clinging to whiteness for psychic and material reasons and in this and the, the dynamics are different I think in the Canadian city although I do have written a bit about this I don't think race is sort of absent or sort of racism is absent in Canada by any means but I do think that's sort of the way that sort of affects politics I do think in the in the Midwest that there has been sort of this long time a generation I think who have clung to politics since the uh, clung to a kind of like masked form of racial resentment for um, a, a, a generation and I'm not convinced that it's sort of that I think that the notion of false consciousness is that sort of they're doing it kind of against their will or they've been kind of duped into it um, I think maybe one of the more depressing parts of there's a book that just came out by a person named Jonathan Metzl, and he, it's called Dying of Whiteness. And he, he uh, traces, um, he's a social psychologist, and he traces these folks in the United States, a lot of the policies of conservatism in the United States actually are killing white people at much greater rates, and the gun deaths, um, the fact that um, it, you know, the very meager uh, medical system that was marginally expanded under Obama was sort of opposed by some very white conservative states, uh, and it's ending up sort of, you know, ending white lives uh, more rapidly than than than, than even non-white lives. Uh, the the gun issue, uh, in particular, that white male suicides are are up. And he goes around and interviews. He interviews people who are literally on their deathbed and asks them, you know, do, do you now, you know, see the problem? You know, they, and they basically have access to very little health care. And sort of, is this, is this a, do you not see? Would you change your mind if you were, you know? because they were hardcore against, you know, because of Obama and all of this sort of thing. And to their death, they're, they know exactly what, I'm willing to die for this. This is a waste of money, it shouldn't exist. I mean, even things that they are clearly not benefiting from. And it's, I'm just, I'm sort of, you know, the kind of easy answer is that, like, they've been duped. But I think that the, the more depressing possibility is they know exactly. For the psychic value of white supremacy is so... In, in tight, intoxicating, right? That they're literally willing to end their lives earlier than to kind of change political alliances. And that, that to me is a much more depressing possibility, but I'm not certain that it's about, um, you know, frogs being boiled, or I think they're very willing frogs, right? Like they, they know what they're, they're getting in for and they're willing to take that pain. And I think that's maybe the more depressing uh, possibility, I guess, certainly in this context. I, again, I don't, I don't know enough about the kind of the context here, but I, I do think that these forces are more than just sort of like an election cycle to, to fight. Thanks. I think there's one question here. Yeah, actually, more like a little bit by way of a statement about what I've seen over the years. Because um, I, I am Coast Salish, and I have resided here in, in this city for the last 36 years, and I have seen the urban uh, community change drastically uh, in that short time span, where, you know, it's, a, um, I actually was making notes to myself to say, okay, in 36 years, I've only moved away from the downtown core for two years, and I moved away because of, um, I was living in subsidized housing at the time. My family size had changed, so I was forced to move away from the downtown or to find an available unit. Well, there was no available units um, readily available to my family because of our race and because of our economic class, right? So we get back on our feet, we moved back downtown because my partner has a job downtown and he doesn't drive, so it was like, oh, okay, so let's move back downtown where we could afford it. But again, you know, it was that race thing, and it was like, okay. Um, so we compromised our you know, nice home um, to move closer to downtown to a substandard housing, right? But when we moved back downtown here, the services that we needed were not available. 
so services like you know affordable groceries, clothing store, mm -hmm. these things have all disappeared over the last few years. So, so downtown is not affordable to people that live here all year round, and you know there's a couple of thrift stores. The rest of the time we're forced to. Um, to shop at corporations, big box yeah. stores. And so things have changed. And, um, you know, I was making a quick note about, you know, restaurants that used to be available down here for, um, you know, 24 hour restaurants. There used to be five of them. Now there's none. Yeah. You know, so things have changed. And so I'm like thinking that's really appropriate to have it, you know the urban decline, you know, was planned because now who's benefiting from having us who live downtown shopping out in the suburbs? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I would extend the other uh, gentrification is planned too in a sense. I mean, that sort of uh, involves conscious action. It involves all sorts of uh, acts, both hidden and not, that create that reality, right? That, that, that um, is happening not just here. It sounds like I didn't know. I mean, I was here last 15 years ago, and it has just visibly changed a, a great deal. But just hearing how expensive things, it does seem like a great deal has changed. But I, I do think that we, as social scientists, we kind of think of these as kind of organic self processes that kind of occur in their logic. But those changes benefit or organized on certain levels. They sort of they benefit certain people more than others, and. Um, I, I think perhaps we could think of that as planned in a, in a sense too, even if it's not sort of created by one malevolent puppet master or something, it doesn't have to be planned in such, use that word in that direct way, but um, they involve organization, they involve common purpose, they involve um, interests that, 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 are, that are differentiated across space, so. Even the um, you know, community <coughs> public services have relocated, you know, there used to be um, a lot of public services available for you know, everything, you know, from, you know, let's talk more about um, poverty advocacy to race relations, um, social housing. They have now moved away from downtown for, um, you know, the city of Victoria at this point right now does not have any inner, um, you know, public services for indigenous people. Their housing and their health care have actually moved way outside of town, which doesn't make it affordable or accessible for a lot of the communities. And when we're talking about gentrification based on, you know, um, economics, right now there's the, we have our own, you know, like poverty area called, you know, the Pandora Street. Okay. High percentage of people living on the streets are all in, um, a three block radius of each other. Um, you know, so, and it's right next to, you know, like the high end, like down here where the Janion building is that sat vacant for a number of years, yeah. now sells condos for a million dollars right wow. next to um, subsidized shelters. So it's like, yeah. that's a real mix. That just happened in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. It does sound dramatic. Very, yeah. 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 I got lots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested in you know the differences between what's happened in the States and what's happened in Canada mm -hmm. and why things have been different. Do you have any thoughts? So I wrote a piece on this, and it was titled "Why There Is No Detroit in Canada," and I'm again trying to emphasize the difference uh, when it comes to race. Um, uh, I guess the short answer is that um, I think a lot of, particularly the legacy impacts, and I was mostly kind of comparing Ontario cities, why who have experienced a great deal of deindustrialization as much, in many ways, as uh, in any city in Michigan or Ohio, but don't have the kind of same outcomes. And I point to kind of these kind of uh, uh, kind of racial histories. I mean, we, we kind of think of, I mean, obviously there's at least it's some kind of effort to kind of reconcile, at least in superficial ways, the sort of uh, toxic relationship that Canada's had with indigenous people in this country. But um, I don't think that there's nearly enough to sort of talk about like the, the um, 
the very concerted effort to keep the country white before 1967 in, in a general sense, or a variety of, uh, you know, that, that, that changed, I think, the political dynamic, particularly in Ontario, that, that, um, um, that uh, there was lots of forms of sort of anti-black racism, either all, you know, black and only schools or black, whites only lunch counters in the 1950s. But they applied to so few people, and this was by design. I mean, there was immigration officials in the 1950s and 1960s in this country who were saying things like, look at the United States, There's, <laughs> look what the impacts of diversification are. Well, we cannot allow you know, uh, you know, uh, non-white peoples to come to this country, and, and did. I mean, they stopped uh, immigration. There was a hierarchy of countries that were sort of, that. so I, I know I keep beating this drum, but I, 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 my explanation, at least in the Ontario case, of why you don't get the same kind of outcomes is that, that though there, is a, there are challenges and there's deindustrialization, does have a lot to do with the kind of accidental impact, or maybe deliberate, I don't know, of, of, um, of population homogeneity, of sort of, of, of you know, the same kinds of issues that became uh, so much more toxic in the United States were uh, motivated by a dynamic where sort of you have 80% Black city and the surrounding areas are 90% white. There's no other place, at least in urban Canada, that is like that. Uh, there are a couple of examples today, if you take uh, sort of Richmond, BC, Markham, and Ontario, where if you combine two very broad groups, East Asian and South Asian, you can get to bare majorities. But those aren't singular groups, right? Like that there's South Asian, there's a variety of different countries. East, just Chinese immigrants in particular are. Differentiate by generation, by parts of China, by Hong Kong, Taiwan. There's lots of variation, and so there, there's not this sort of same kind of threat propagation as say poor black people moving from the American South to Detroit, or poor Mexican people moving from uh, to, to Los Angeles, and the, the reaction that 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 that, that imposes. So I, I think a lot of the, the differences, at least in this context, have to do with um, very planned efforts to kind of keep things relatively homogeneous. What has happened since then? I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I don't think you know, the type of immigration, particularly that um, has occurred in, particularly in um, uh, Toronto, is a very in Vancouver is very much favored wealthier immigrants favored. So it's it's not the same. There isn't the same kind of like, except for the sort of late nineteenth, early twentieth century, we had large migrations of Chinese and Japanese people to this country, large migrations of Irish people. There really isn't a large migration of, of refugees uh, to Canada, of, of economic refugees, comparable to, say, sort of internal migrations like the Great Migration in the United States or uh, migration from Latin America to, to, the, to the Southeast, so, or to, to the Southwest of the United States. So I think a lot of it, it's, it's sort of indelicate to kind of point it out this way, but I do think a lot of it does come back, to, those differences come back to race, but not perhaps in the way that we as Canadians want to think of ourselves as, but perhaps in a, in, a, in a way that's not as attractive as that. So, uh, but I have written about it, and I, I'd be happy if you want to give me a, if you have a card or something. There's a, a paper I've written that actually tries to uh, think about this in, more, in a more serious way. So, thank you. Over here, so. Yeah, thanks for your talk, uh, Jason. Um, Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Segregation uh, by design. design. Yeah. And uh, discussing the 19th, 20th century yeah. Yeah. Um, class and race based segregation that happens in terms of focusing on those intersections. Um, I, yeah, I see a lot of residents that yeah. have some exaggeration folks. Particularly legacy effects, it's exactly the same argument. She's one of the people who writes about that. Yeah, and, um, well, and, and my, my question sort of spurred off that. Uh, so, how intrinsically linked? Explicitly addressed it in the book, although I think it's implicitly there that there is a kind of division. I think my own thinking derives, as I was talking about earlier today, uh, is Du Boisian uh, from W. E. B. Du Bois, um, and that's how I pronounce his name. Um, 
and he basically argued that yeah, that, that in the, uh, on this on this note that um, the white working class is, is itself a construction, right? Like it's not sort of it, it, it's very difficult to kind of adapt kind of kind of purely Marxian or kind of uh, theories of class to the United States because um, the white working class has been uh, very directly co-opted. Uh, to play a particular role, and it's not just sort of in a psychic way, it, ha it is um, in that as well, but there are fundamental material differences between the treatment that the white working class receives by police, by access to jobs, access by unions, um, and have, and so, um, and uh, even and even in the context, and, and even if you put those aside, there's sort of psychic advantages that I was talking about a moment ago, even when they're not, even when they're literally on their deathbed, there's obviously sort of a great deal of intoxication. Just the belief that there is there is some, um, uh, you know, a, a, a advantage to this. I didn't explicitly um, uh, address it in, in in a kind of theorized uh, way in, in this book, but it, it very much is sort of the political acts in this that I feel like the the kind of fundamental. Uh, you know, issue that needs to be challenged is if there is any sort of like more cooperative way to kind of build uh, or rebuild these societies and uh, create a more caring environment um, is as much about kind of racial division as, as, as class division. And while I think that the sort of elites of capitalism are exploiting these, these elements, I think that there's a lot of very organic, very authentic racism that comes from the white working class and, and, and is uh, responsible, I think, for, I mean, we see it with, with Trump right now that um, how loyal, right, like that no matter what he does, really, that in fact it's the, as Adam Server taught, says it's the cruelty is the point, the fact that he is who he is, that, that this is this is not just sort of a, 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 a tick, this is the feature, this is the thing that is the most appealing this is a kind of, he's a very visceral form of racial reaction himself, and that this, he kind of, um, and so it, it's, it's, I don't have very many optimistic things to say, but I do think that all we can do is sort of shine a light on it, and I do think that it's not, it's not simply as easy as just sort of like getting a kind of, you know, Joe Biden or white working class, or, you know, um, kind of politician, the kind of gesture to these things, because I think that the very embedded nature of uh, racial reaction both as part of, of capitalism, but also as a, its own separate animal, uh, are, are formidable and not just as historical items. Well, it's time, so I have to okay. thank you very much for your for coming here. And this concludes our poll series, City and, uh, City and Politics. Um, our next series, the Spring Series, will start on January 23rd, and it will be on changing memory scapes in the city. That's the title, the theme of the series for the Spring. So it will be about debates on statues and monuments uh, in the urban context. The first speaker is on January 23rd, uh, Emma Reynards, uh, a journalist and a graduate of UBC. You can find more information on our website, thecitytalks.ca. So uh, please check it and um, see you in January. Thank you for coming. Thank you.